time ago, or not a long time ago, but over the last, you know, 15 years or so that I've been studying meditation and yoga and mindfulness, I've seen a change in how I show up to my creative process. And about seven years ago, <laughs> I decided to like look into that just a little bit deeper and to see what had changed in me to refine my creative process. And so I spent a couple of years doing some study. I looked at some Western models of psychology that talk about creativity. I looked at some uh, of like the Oprah's and Elizabeth Gilbert's of the world, like the Eat, Pray, Love Girl, <laughs> about how they view creativity. Liz Gilbert actually has a really great po podcast on creativity, um, or uh, TED Talk, sorry, on creativity that um, actually helped inspire a lot of my moving forward with the research of this topic. And then I also looked back at some of the ancient models of how to look at the mind and figure out where do these all come together? What's a contemporary understanding of all of this? And so that's what I'm going to go through today. And I have a PowerPoint presentation for you and everything. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Um, there we go. All right. Cool, cool. So this is called, again, Unblocking Your Creativity. And again, I'm Jerry Givens. <laughs> I'm a med yoga and med meditation educator, a life coach, and I've actually been published a few times, which feels really great considering, you know, I started off as a writer, just, you know, writing whatever. Um, my most recent publication is called Essential Pranayama, Breathing Techniques for Balance, Healing, and Peace that came out in April. And basically, it's just a book on breath work from the yogic perspective, talking about the respiratory system, talking about how yoga views, how breath works. And um, there's some techniques for every, every level, beginner, intermediate, advanced. And then on the far end of that spectrum, and this is where creativity really gets exciting for me, is my novels. I love writing and fantasy adventure novels. I've written a trilogy already. I have a fourth one that is not yet published that's written. I'm writing a fifth one right now. It's something that I really vibe on that is totally just not related to, you know, like yoga or my profession. Or so I thought until I started to dive into this a little bit deeper um, in my study. I realized that they were very much, very much connected. So I just want to give you the basis understanding of what mindfulness is. I like to do this with any time we talk about mindfulness because I just want to demystify it a bit for you. And so while there are many definitions, my definition is the compassionate present awareness of your thoughts, emotions, speech, actions, and the effect on the world around you. And then of course, the world around you's effect on all of that. You know, like how does the world affect you? And the basis of everything I'm sharing with you today is compassion, kindness, non-harming, and honesty. And so that's mostly with yourself. Definitely want that to be true for you and to the world and toward other people. But we wanna make sure that as we're dealing with ourselves, especially when it comes to creativity, because it really is an internal process for a lot of folks, um, that we are not beating ourselves over the head with anything negative <laughs> as much as we can. So when I'm speaking, about different concepts here. I'm speaking from this place of non-harming and compassion. It's all very lovey-dovey. It's just, we go, we go along with it. All right, so how does mindfulness and creativity work together? Um, mindfulness asks to know ourselves so that we can live happier and compassionate lives. And when you know this, <laughs> you can actually help to unblock your creativity even more. You can connect to inspiration. You can think outside of the box. You can access resources that you didn't think of before because you're not so constricted in whatever tunnel vision that you might be having at a particular moment. And resolving these blocks, again, will make you a little bit more creative. So we're going to talk about what these blocks are. Yoga um, philosophy has its own ideas of how these blocks kind of manifest for you. Um, and we'll take a look at blocks overall as well, and including remedies. We're not just going to tell you what the problem is. I'm going to help give you some solutions to them as well. Before we do that, let's spend a moment just being mindful. So I always like to start with a brief little inward turning. So wherever you're at, you can be seated, you can be lying down, you can be doing whatever, but just take a moment and stop. And close your eyes if that feels okay for you. I want you to take a couple of deep breaths with me. So take a deep breath in through your nose, please. 
Maybe feeling the lungs a bit more than you normally do. And then exhale through your mouth. And do that again. Inhale through your nose, long, deep inhale. And a relaxed exhale. There might even be a sound on it, maybe a sigh or a soft <sighs> exasperation of the breath. And just stopping and being aware of the breath just helps to bring you to a more present place. You're aware of your body here. And while the mind might still be moving, and that's fine, you're now aware that the mind is moving. You're not kind of caught up in the cyclone of it, which is the first step is awareness, as we'll learn as we move forward. Take a few more of these breaths together, in through the nose, out through the mouth, just feeling maybe a little bit more calm than before we went inward. And take an even bigger breath. And then allow your eyes to open. Bringing yourself on back. If anything, a mindful moment, and you can do this anytime you want to, <laughs> just helps to bring you a bit more present. And that is a great place to create from. It's a great place to be aware of where you might be blocked and how to find a remedy that works for you. So what we're going to talk about today are just a few um, principles here is what is creative block? We'll define it for you. <laughs> We'll talk about what is the creative uh, process through my own definition, how I've studied and learned it. We'll talk about what the obstacles are or what buckets the obstacles might fit into. And then of course, we'll talk about some ways to move through and pass those obstacles. Some of those uh, remedies are short and quick, just easy, quick mindset changes. And some of them might be as big as lifestyle changes. And so how far you go is up to you. What you take from this uh, workshop or from this talk is up to you. You know, take what works, leave that what doesn't. Um, it's all an invitation into maybe a new understanding for you. So what is creative block? We all have it. It's like artist block, writer's block, painter's block. Anytime that you're in a creative process and you hit a wall and you don't know what to do. You just don't know. We get frustrated. We get angry about it. <laughs> we get sad about it. So what is it? Um, how it shows up is you can't think of what to do next. Um, you might just feel stagnation, like the process just slows down. You know, you were doing good, and then all of a sudden, you're just not. Um, again, it can show up as writer's block. And then one way it shows up is just a blank or dissociative mind. Like every time you go to work on this project or to write this paper or whatever it is, your mind just goes anywhere else. You start thinking about that TV show you watched last night. You start thinking about that podcast you listened to, or you, know, you start thinking of other things that you could be doing other than working on this one thing. And so that's how it shows up. What is it? Um, in my view, Creative block is caused by negative critical tendencies of your mind. So you're being judgmental or you're falling into states of fear. And this causes your creative process to freeze or your mind to become distracted or avoidant. Um, and it's caused by one of the five obstacles, which we'll talk about later, um, all of which dysregulate your nervous system. Um, a good thing to note about this definition is that it's not placing the blame of the block on something other than yourself. And I'm not trying to blame you, like, again, compassion on harming here. But a lot of times we try to think of creative block as something in the universe, the world has stopped communicating with us and that's the issue, like it's something external. This puts the, the onus on you to go do your inner work to find out what's going on inside of you to keep you from moving forward with this. And so it's putting the responsibility back on yourself. And we'll talk about the compassionate ways you can do that without shaming yourself. And I always, and I feel like in every talk that I give, I always talk about the nervous system because that's the basis of this 
of this work around mindfulness. So let's talk about the autonomic nervous system really quickly here. And so what we probably know most about is the sympathetic response, which is your fight or flight response as it's um, commonly known. But there are some other qualifications to it as well. There's freezing, which definitely is a part of creative block. There's uh, fainting or collapsing, where we just kind of just stop moving. Um, and then a new qualification that came into my awareness in the last couple of years is befriend. It's when like something is threatening to you in, the, in your environment, and so you try to make friends with it so that it's no longer going to be a threat to you. Um, but that is a survival tendency. So this is your classical survival mode. Um, when you're stuck in your sympathetic response, it's releasing the stress hormone, hormone cortisol into your bloodstream. Um, it's not a bad response. It's a biological part of your system, and we need this for survival, um, but only survival in response to imminent danger. And I'll throw, I'll throw out a line here and say that when you're in the creative process, usually you're not in danger. 99% of the time, you're not going to die if you mess this up or if you do something wrong in it. Um, we'll talk more about that later. <laughs> the prolonged state of this response can cause burnout. It's one reason why I want to try to manage it. And um, when we are stuck in the sympathetic state, when we're freezing, when we're collapsing, it shuts down our ability to create constructively. There might be movement creatively, but it's usually with a whip to our back and we feel constricted around it. We'll talk about how this shows up later. Now, the other side of this, of course, is the parasympathetic response, your calm, grounded, rest and digest response. When you're calmer in your body, you're just better able to be a creative person. You're not uh, creating from spaces of fear or uh, attachment, and we'll get into all of that later. <laughs> um, the, sympathetic, the parasympathetic response is cultivated through psychological um, and physical safety. So we wanna make sure that the environment is conducive. Um, when you're in the state, your blood pressure can be lowered, your anxiety is reduced, and your mood overall is improved. It's a healing and restorative response. It's the actual natural resting state of your nervous system. And it's the ideal space for creativity. And yeah, so just to kind of wrap that up really quickly, while creativity can definitely occur in activated sympathetic or fight or flight states, it often comes at the price of our sanity. We kind of drive ourselves crazy because we're pushing too hard on ourselves against the grain. Um, procrastination and perfectionism show up in this. Um, we'll talk about those later. And then conversely, when we create from our par parasympathetic state, we're better able to see actually the bigger picture. We can step outside of limited viewpoints and we are not responding to insecurities and the blocks themselves can dissolve. So in a nutshell, mindfulness helps to regulate the nervous system and a regulated nervous system helps you be more creative. That's probably the thesis of all of this. So let's dig a little bit deeper into this and let's define what the creative process is as I've studied it and as I've kind of defined it as well. And so I have taken the creative process from the original putting together of ideas to the final product and I put it into three different stages, if you will. Now these don't always act linearly and sometimes you're in multiple stages at once, but I'm just presenting them in a linear way, kind of like the funnel from uh, conception down into final delivery. So there is the bucket of inspiration, like where do ideas come from? And there's translation, what do you do with those ideas? And manifestation, how do you bring those out into the world? Good, so inspiration, I'm going to, to just suggest that it comes from something bigger than yourself. <laughs> and I'm also gonna suggest and make an assumption that it's always out there, it's always flowing. Um, now, we do not have to philosophically agree on where inspiration comes from because we have all our own beliefs and I'm a believer that that's completely fine. Um, some people believe it to be divine whispers or spirits or, you know, pragmatically a culmination of past experiences. And some people just believe it to be fleeting, like sometimes you're inspired and sometimes you're not and you just act in accordance to whenever that is. But I do think it's important to, in the res resolution of creative block to allow inspiration to be something that's not connected 
to you in the sense that it's not you. Like you are not the source of your creativity. There's something bigger in the world or universe that is feeding you. And again, that can be the culmination of all of the past experiences that you've ever had that are just kind of sitting in the subconscious and you really can't access them in a conscious way. They're still driving you forward. And that's still bigger than who you are in this consciousness right now. So, yeah. And also, it also helps you with humility. Um, if you do really good and you're a winner, you know, you don't get cocky. You don't become a narcissist. And if you um, bomb, if your project completely just, it's completely terrible, don't worry. You didn't do it all. Something else was here that you could kind of uh, give, some, give some credit towards. So we'll talk about more how that, that connects when we get to the obstacles. But... The, uh, the thesis with inspiration is that it's bigger than you, and then it's always out there, that you can connect to it anytime you need to. Now, where a creative block actually comes in here is in the stage of translation. This is your mind. And so you kind of think about inspiration as this, you know, fluid or something coming down into your body or into your mind. And then you have to figure out internally what to do with this. And so this is the home of creative block. This is where we get kind of caught in some of our uh, psychoses. So um, yeah, inspiration is filtered through your experience in this body and then manifested out into this world. And your mind gets to decide what is kept and what is not kept, what is discarded, what ideas are kept um, and moved through into the factory, <laughs> if you will, and what is just thrown in on, on the you know, director's room floor. Um, this is where negative and constructive, constructive critical thinking can occur in the creative process. We'll talk more, more about that on the next slide. And, you know, this is also where, you know, all of your experiences, your biases, your traumas, your expectations, your desires, and your needs, they all dictate what stays and what goes. This is where mindfulness really comes in handy because you are asked to know about all this for yourself. And we're doing some of your own spiritual or psychological self-work can help you just open your mind to be a little bit bigger. So I have kind of like split the critical mind. It's so like the part of you that says yes or no, or as I like to call the great editor, it's the one that's kind of like crossing out words that don't work um, and writing in new ones that do better. It's either deconstructive, it's either destructive or constructive. And so I'm gonna throw this into the negative or positive pile here. So it's the job of the critical mind to, to assess the inherent value of inspiration, decide to keep it or not. Um, when we're open-minded and when we're relatively calm, we're better able to see the value of those ideas. When we're not regulated, the critical mind quickly dismisses possibilities, limiting your ability to think more creatively or out of the box. Um, destructive critical thought is the source of creative block in my mind. Like when I say creative block, I really do mean destructive critical thinking. It's your fears and your anxieties that keep you from seeing the bigger picture. And so if we're thinking about this funnel of inspiration coming into your body or into your mind from wherever it comes from, um, destructive critical thinking is just shooting ideas down without even considering them. It's just like, nope, we don't do that. Nope, we don't do that. Nope, we don't do that. And at the end of that process, you're left with nothing on the table. Where a more open mind, when you're more in your regulated nervous system, ideas might come in and again, they might not work at the end of the day, but you're willing to consider them and maybe take the good with the bad. Or you understand that sometimes to get to the good ideas, you have to move through the bad ideas because they're derivative of the bad ideas. Um, yeah, so creative block is destructive critical thinking. Now the last stage of the creative process is manifestation. So it's taking the filtered inspiration that's come through your mind and bringing it forth into the world in some way. It's not the finished product, that's just an entity in and of itself, but it's actually the skill and competency that you use to create. So it's like the hours that go into writing a novel or to creating this project that you're, that you're bringing into the world. It's the you know, the years of formal education or informal education, apprenticeship or extended practice that you have that allows you to actually bring forward, forward what it is. Um, a good example of how this, how manifestation <laughs> is not the final product itself so much is that if you're not trained to use, say, an instrument, but you have like this melody in your head, 
you can't you can't manifest that you have to actually go actually you have to go out and learn how to play guitar before you can bring that melody forward so like this is a part of your process as well um yeah so that is the creative process it is inspiration translation and manifestation and creative block exists in the middle there inside of the mind and because of that we can work with it from a, both a psychological and philosophical level so the five obstacles i'm going to take a drink here as part of my mindfulness practice is i do these talks and i just like barrel through them and i'm hoarse afterwards take care of yourself you need a drink get a drink um, so these are the five obstacles that keep us from being creative in certain times. So if you find yourself, if you're aware that you are blocked, you can ask yourself if this feeling of being blocked falls into one of these five buckets and then kind of do your work around it. Now the kicker is it might fall into more than one, but we'll work with that as it comes forward. So according to yoga philosophy, there are five causes of suffering. And, you know, I translated that into being the source of the creative block, like that's really worked in the way that I've studied this and the way that I've taught this. And so in a nutshell, if you're experiencing creative block, turn to one of these, seek resolution and seek a regulation for your nervous system. And so the five blocks are misunderstanding, egoism, attachment, aversion, and lastly, fear. And again, you might have a couple of these going on at one time. So let's go through them each specifically. I try to use like animals in these pictures because uh, <laughs> just a little less, a little less real for some of us. <laughs> um, so misunderstanding, when I'm saying this, it's misunderstanding something about yourself, your process, or your expectation um, about the process or about the project. Um, you may believe unconsciously or consciously that your entire self-worth is attached to this project or to this vocation. And because of that, and because of your insecurities around that, you shut down, you collapse within yourself and you can't do the project. So it's saying that um, if this project ends up being terrible, I'm worthless and not worthy of love and acceptance. Like, I'm not saying that's a, that's a conscious thought you're having, but if you break down, if you go back through the psychological processing that created some of these insecurities, you may find that that's true for you. Um, yeah, I just said that, this is inherently insecurity. Um, another misunderstanding that I hear quite often with people when it comes to teaching about creativity and talking about creativity is that they're like, oh, I'm not a creative person, so I can't, I can't do that. And that's just not true. Humans biologically at our core are creative people. Creativity is why we've been able to evolve into the species that we've become is because we can take we can look at say like a rock and see it as a tool like that is creativity. It's more in the mind and it's about seeing beyond the blatant object that's in front of us. And so it might not mean that we're all artists in the classical sense. It doesn't mean we're all out there writing novels or, you know, becoming musicians or painters, but we are creative people, creators. There we go. <laughs> we are all creators in our, in our own way. You don't have to create art to be creative. Um, though we could spend an entire hour talking about what is art, but... If you feel like you're not a creative person, I want you to challenge that. Could any other possibility exist? In what ways are you being creative in your life? So some rem remedies if you find yourself stuck in this block is to ask yourself some just general questions about it. What am I misunderstanding about myself or this project? Like, am I responding to some insecurity? Am I putting too much pressure on myself for what this means in the big picture or long term? You know, like, if we have like a project at work, for, for example, and we don't do a good job on it, does it, is it making us question our entire career and, <laughs> and everything we've done in our lives? Like, is it that deep? You know, ask yourself, am I putting too much pressure on myself? That's a great question to ask yourself if you find yourself in this, um, this block. Good. So the next one is egoism, so, or as I like to call misidentification. And this kind of comes back to this idea that you are the source of your creativity because you're not the source of your inspiration. This is separating yourself from the greater expanse of understanding and inspiration that the world can provide for you. Um, yeah, when we identify with the outcome, it's also when we identify with the outcome of the work, um, 
So like, if I'm a bad person, if this project is bad, or I'm a good person, if this work is good, we put our entire personal value onto the outcome of this thing that we're creating. Um, <laughs> you know, like I, I, I had to struggle with this when I was started writing novels. I'm like, I'm not a classically trained writer and like nobody's gonna like this and it's gonna be terrible. And I just kept putting the, however anybody else thought about this project or this novel in this case, onto myself as the value of who I am. And I was able to move past that. <laughs> and I was able to create better. I, I got out of that collapse there. Um, yeah, so this last point here, sorry, I was like kind of reading it to refresh myself because I went off on a tangent there. <laughs> and the idea here is to do your work, express your creativity with a sense of openness without, uh, to the outcome without being about you in the end. Like it doesn't have to be about you in the end. So if you find yourself stuck in this, what do you do? You ask yourself these questions. Am I aligned internally with the purpose this holds in my life? Like, is this project really the ultimate expression of who I am as a person? Or is it just a project that I'm doing? And yes, it has value, but is it the value of who I am? Um, yeah, and is, am I attaching the outcome of this work to my overall value as a person? So again, is, a lot of this is doing that inner deeper psychological work. It's asking yourself who you are and the importance of what you're doing um, versus who you actually are at your core. So I put that the, this one actually has a person in it um, because a lot of people are attached to coffee. And so I thought I'd make it real for you on this one. Um, we also can become attached to like what the outcome and the process has to look like. Like we create an outline for it and we're like, it has to go in this way. Um, we just get really stuck that this has to be the way that this thing has to turn out. And being attached to that makes it so that we can't see any other possibilities, that it really has to go down into this, this lane. And if we divert it all, then we become chaos. Chaos will just ensue. Um, so we can get stuck in the weeds and we get blocked and we have a really limited scope. So we talk about this in psychology as working with event horizon. And so when we are this close to something, you know, if I'm this close to my hand, I can only see like a couple of lines on my palm and I can see some stuff in my periphery, but I can't see too much here. But if I just pull myself away from having to see just that, I can see my hand, I can see my computer, I can see the things around the space that I'm in. I can just see the bigger picture a little bit clearly. And I might be able to see other possibilities than just what I feel attached to has to be the answer. And so being attached to something, uh, how something should work is like saying stuff like, we've always done it this way, or this has to go this way for me, or you can probably think of some for yourself. <laughs> um, but how do we resolve this? We resolve this by asking ourselves questions like, am I attached to anything regarding this project that might restrict my thinking? Am I in tunnel vision? Do I have a strict or limited method that is keeping me from moving forward? And we see this a lot in you know, classical organizations where you know, a process has been defined and it's probably been time tested as well, but the environment changes, the industry changes. We're finding that out with COVID right now, where the way things that we've done, well, the way that we've done things for so long, which has worked, you know, pre-March, don't work anymore. We have to think outside of the box. We have to get really creative how, how we, we approach things and we can't be attached to the way that we've always done things. So this block is asking us to step back from that and see what else might be possible. Now, the other side of this coin to attachment is aversion or denial. And so it's when we avoid certain avenues of thought through innate discrimination. Maybe we just don't like thinking about certain things or we have a bias that keeps us from thinking about that. When we get into hive mind mentalities, and this could be internal or it also could be in your organization, um, certain ideas fall outside that comfort zone. So this is the, the, the block where I say like, go outside of the box, think outside of the box, what else could be true beyond um, how you've uh, been thinking about things beforehand. And so there might be certain ideas that you inherently 
are averse to. <laughs> I'm trying to think of some examples from a corporate perspective. Um, one I could take from an organization that I used to work for, um, that's another part of my, my whole story as I actually worked in corporate for a while, is that a boss of mine or a CEO for the company I worked for was very averse to working from home because they grew up, you know, in a part of the world where, you know, you, your productivity had to be seen. Like you had to like have tabs on people or else they'd slack off and, you know, bad things would happen. And that person had to start thinking a little bit more outside of the box on that. One, the industry changed, it's the tech industry, and more companies were offering work from home advantages. And this is pre-COVID. And one thing that we saw as we had to start playing around with that idea because the industry, the environment was demanding it, was that productivity didn't really change when people work from home. If anything, they were more productive um, for various reasons. And then of course, COVID does happen and now everybody's, everybody's working from home. So it becomes the standard already. And who knows how that could have been. There might've been a little less suffering or a little less, uh, we'll call it suffering, why not? For that person, that CEO, if they had just allowed that to happen without being attached to old ideals and averse to these new ideas. So the biggest aversion that we can probably see on a personal level is probably procrastination. It comes up all the time. And there's a lot of distractions in the world that kind of keep us in this model, but avoidance because it makes you uncomfortable, part of you doesn't want to do it, or because you're overwhelmed by the task, that, that's, that, that's suffering. That's, being, that's, that's creative block for me. Um, there is the internal argument that I hear from a lot of people that they just work well under pressure. And I hear that, of course, you have to be productive or creative in a time crunch, but at what cost? You know, are you able to see new ideas? Are you able to see a bigger picture if you only have, you know, a day to get this project done that you've had been working on for a month? That puts you in your sympathetic state. That makes you, that, that sends cortisol into your bloodstream, that, that taxes your adrenals. That's not ultimately healthy. And if you do that too much, again, that can cause burnout. So can we create in a way that doesn't do that for ourselves? Yeah, so remedies. Just don't procrastinate, I'm just kidding. Um, ask yourself, am I averse to anything regarding the project that might restrict my thinking? Am I putting off this project because I'm uncomfortable with aspects of it, which can include judgment of its outcomes? Like maybe you're procrastinating because like, you just know that you don't wanna face the music when it comes to whatever, however this is received. And just also asking yourself a blatant question, do I just not wanna do this? Am I just really not wanting to do this? Because sometimes just by knowing that, it actually removes the block. <laughs> You're like, okay, I don't wanna do this. I've acknowledged that. All right, can I just get this done then? Sometimes just acknowledging that and not letting it just be the thing pushing against you because that which we resist persists. So if we just acknowledge that there's, there's an internal conflict, sometimes that's enough to move us past it. So we're almost there. We have one more block to talk about and that is the big one, it's fear. Many people are constricted around their creative process because they're afraid. And it makes sense because fear is inherent when it comes to creating anything new because it might be judged, it might fail, it might succeed. There's a lot that could come with it. Um, but according to yoga philosophy, at your, at your core, when you're afraid of something, if it's bad, you're afraid that you actually might die. And that's a philosophical statement, but if you were to trace back psychologically your fear, it comes down to things like not being accepted or not um, being integrated into your community, which means that you'll be left alone, which means that you'll have to fend for yourself and you can't fend for yourself, and so you'll die. That is the subconscious, <laughs> you know, building yourself up in these tendencies. So you can intellectually know, of course, like doing bad on this project or not, um, succeeding here will not kill you, but at its core, at a psychological core, that's kind of what this is arguing. And so you can ask yourself a question like, is this going to kill me? Again, most of the time, unless you're like diffusing a bomb or something, most of the time, <laughs> um, you're not going to, you're not going to. And sometimes that will, alle will actually alleviate some of the pressure. But again, fear in the creative process can be unavoidable. And therefore, we have to change our relationship to fear. And so a way to do that is actually just how I asked is, is this going to kill me? It's like, okay, no, it's, I'm not 
going to die from this. So there's something else here. There's something else present that's keeping me from it. Is it one of the other blocks? Maybe you can go down that avenue. Now I love to talk about perfectionism because I am a recovering perfectionist myself. I cringe. Oh, one of my first job interviews, I was in college, and they ask you like, what's one of your, what's one of your strengths? And I'm like, oh, I'm a perfectionist. And I'm like, that's such a wrong answer. <laughs> <laughs> that is such a wrong answer. I wouldn't hire anybody who said that um, these days. Uh, because really what it says is like that's your world by fear that you can't get anything done. Perfectionist keep, perfectionism keeps you from getting the projects finished every time. And for creativity, for free creativity, it's the big killer because nothing is ever going to be good enough. And you're just continually stuck in a cycle of being blocked. And so you continue to work at it and nothing ever really gets finished. So if you find yourself in perfectionist tendencies, you're just afraid. And so work with that fear, dig into it, find out why it's there for you. Liz Gilbert, who I mentioned earlier, she has the one who has the TED talk on uh, the creative genius. I recommend watching it. It's about 20 minutes. Um, she says, perfectionism is just fear in high heels. She has a fancy way of talking about being afraid. So yeah. How do we re remedy this? Um, what am I, you can ask yourself, what am I afraid will happen if this project fails or succeeds? You know, like there might be some like irrational ideas around that. So you can ask yourself, if, is that assumption true? Like, will I lose my job? Like, will people think less of me? Or is this just another bump in the road? Um, and if it's not perfect, can, I, can this project still hold value? Like if it's like say 90% perfect, like you did 90% well, or it resonated 90% well with folks, like, can that still be enough? Like, it's, is that okay? Like, you're still like contributing to the greater cause at that case. Um, but when it comes to fear and when it comes to all these blocks, have compassion for yourself, especially with fear because fear is so natural in this process, um, but it doesn't have to stop you from being creative. And that's a good thing to remember that with all these blocks that I've talked about, they're gonna still come up because we're humans and these are all human tendencies, but they don't have to stop you. A block means that you're completely blocked from moving forward. But through understanding and through finessing some of these ideas, you can start to move past some of those blocks. Good. But there are more remedies than that. And of course I kind of put remedies after each block, but in general, there are behaviors and mindsets that you can adopt that just help you to be a more open-minded person in general and therefore a more openly creative person. So self-awareness is key. That's gonna be key for any work you do around unblocking yourself creatively. And so know yourself on all levels or seek to know yourself on all levels and be able to identify when you are actually being blocked. Because sometimes we don't even know it. We're just like fall into the frustration. We just let that be the case. So we fall into perfectionism or procrastination. We just let that be the reality. And so notice, have awarenesses like, oh, I'm, I'm frustrated, so I'm blocked. Let's find out why or I'm ambivalent, or I'm apathetic, or I'm dissociating, I'm just becoming distracted all the time. Um, fatigue is another form of distraction. You know, you're working on something and all of a sudden you're just like really, really tired. Um, usually that's not related to you actually being fatigued physically. It's more just because your mind just doesn't want to do it anymore. So there's that. So some self-awareness practices, and these are again just to help you be aware of yourself in a moment to moment way. There's of course meditation, which I'll always plug. Coaching, you know, you can have somebody reflect back to you and help you grow. Um, therapy, another great way, to, especially if you're looking at the causes of some of these blocks, like how did this tendency get implanted in my system? You know, usually it's early on. Um, you can have mentors, you can have people who are in your daily moment to moment life who can help empathetically reflect to you how everything is going. A great boss, a great coworker, um, somebody you look up to, maybe not at your company, but in your industry. And then a great internal way to do it is, is journaling. Journaling is a great way to take any experience you have and integrate it into your system. And so when you are out in the world and you're experiencing things, it's very right brain or abstract. And when you journal or you write, write about the experience, it helps to make it a little bit more compartmentalized or linear in your mind. So it moves into that left brain space. So it can actually help you understand your experiences a little bit deeper. So I love journaling. Very recently, I didn't always love it, but very recently. And then general self-care, you know, like a healthy system, physically, emotionally, mentally, is going to, of course, make it so that you can create better. 
um, you'll be at your peak capacity. Sleep, sleep is so important. Like <laughs> one reason why people are stuck in their sympathetic nervous systems and blocked creatively is because they're just tired. So sleep, just sleep. Spend time in nature, it's a great way to regulate. Of course, yoga and exercise, build up those endorphins. Take breaks as often as you can and need to, especially if you start to feel yourself in some of those uh, tendencies I mentioned before, like the frustration, the uh, ambivalence, like that just means that you need a break. Um, taking time to retreat, whether that's going on like a week long retreat, you know, post COVID <laughs> somewhere and like you, you know, you're meditating all the time or whether it's, you know, just taking a moment away from the busyness of life to actually restore. And then eating well, you know, and eating well is unique to each individual. I'm not going to like plug a specific diet because we are all different people and we all need different things. So just know what works for you and allow that to be a part of your, your routine. Good. So some additional notes. <laughs> this all takes practice. This is not meant to be like a go out and do it. Like this is not a magic pill, but awareness is the first step and knowing that you're stuck is the first step. And from there, you can move past it. And I've given you a couple of ideas how to move past it. But really just being aware that you're in a block is really a lot of the work here. So practice, be compassionate towards yourself. Um, with time and increased self-knowledge, you'll be more readily able to drop into the space, the space of unrestricted uh, or less restricted creativity. I found that to be true with myself. That's the difference that I noticed as I started practicing mindfulness and yoga is that I was just, I just had more access. I was less distracted, I was less blocked. And just stay in the endeavor. I, every day is gonna be different. Some days I have free flow and creativity, it's awesome. And some days I can't do anything and I have to like sit down and find out what's going on, okay? So just a review of what we talked about. Um, we talked about what is creative block. We talked about the creative process, the obstacles, of course, and then just some remedies for the obstacles, things like self-awareness and self-care. All right, so um, we are kind of at time already. I spent a little bit more time talking than I meant to, um, but I do wanna spend, if you have time, maybe just maybe three to four minutes just going inward again and just do a quick, inner scan to help us relax a bit more and maybe even explore creativity a bit. So if you're, if you're down for it, just sit comfortably for a minute and close your eyes. With your eyes closed, just notice your body real quick and notice if you feel any tension, any squeezing, any hardening, any gripping, When it comes to being blocked creatively, that those creative blocks are like these tightening of the muscles in our bodies. And so in the same way that we can take deep breaths and ask those parts of our bodies to soften and relax, we can do that as well with some of our blocks creatively. If you find yourself stuck in a feeling of perfectionism, so words like this will never be good enough, or I just have to revise this one more time again. You can just close your eyes. You can just take a few moments and breathe. It's almost like you're creating space for that tendency to dissipate. Aware of the inhale, aware of your exhale. Sometimes all you need is a break. As I mentioned before, sometimes we're so tunnel visioned into the project, into the process that we can't see, we can't see past the trees. So we take a breath, we go inward, we take a break, we breathe. And we allow the intensity of whatever block we are wrapped around, we allow the tendency of that to soften. We allow it to relax. Soft breath in, 
and soft breath out. Just a few more of these soft breaths. And then take a deeper, fuller breath. And go ahead and bring yourself on and back, slowly allowing the eyes to open. So even again, just a few moments of stepping back and being with yourself and breathing can change the quality of your current state, physically, emotionally, mentally. And that shift alone, based on that nervous system re regulation, can allow you to move past or even just be more empathetic and compassionate toward a block that you might currently be in. So if you'd like to stay mindful with me, <laughs> there are a few ways to do so. I teach some weekly classes online uh, through Zoom on Mondays and Thursdays, yoga classes those are, at 6 p.m. Pacific time. And you can check out jerrygibbons.net for that. I do offer online coaching especially during COVID. So if there's a block you're dealing with or there's something else just personally that you wanna work with, um, I would love to help support you in that. And then there's also some free meditations that I offer online through the app Insight Timer. You can just search my name, Jerry Gibbons. It's a free app. And um, I think there's about seven on there right now. And you can always keep up with me at jerrygibbons.net. I do a lot more stuff. All my books are on there as well if you wanna dig into what I've been up to creatively. And yeah, all right. Thank you so much for being here. I hope this has been helpful and insightful or at least a little bit curious for yourself. And I look forward to seeing you all again soon. Take care, thank you. Sorry for going over on time. <laughs> thank you. You're so welcome, you're so welcome. Thank you. Of course, of course. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Uh, when he mentioned that there's a lot of stuff to ruminate on, definitely there's presenting some ideas here for you. Continue to sit with it, continue to integrate it um, and see what sticks for you. Yeah. That was great, Jerry. Thank you. You're so welcome. You're so welcome. Some fun ideas, some fun ideas. <laughs> All right, well, I'm gonna sign off, but thank you, uh, Brooke and Aptus again. I appreciate you having me and I hope you all have a great week. Take care. You too, Jerry, thanks. My pleasure. Thanks, Jerry. You're welcome. <laughs>